This is episode 20 of the Magic Detective Podcast. On this episode, I talk more about the World of Magic specials presented by Doug Henning. That and more on this episode of the Magic Detective Podcast. Hello and welcome to the Magic Detective Podcast. I'm your host, Dean Carnegie. I am the Magic Detective, and this is episode 20. It's a bit of a milestone having reached the 20th episode. And by the way, thank you to everyone that listens uh, because we recently broke the 2000 download mark. That's pretty exciting. If you're new to the podcast, uh, basically, here I talk all about magic history. I do not reveal magic secrets, though. Uh, However, if you listen really close, uh, you may occasionally be able to read between the lines. There may be some minor secrets given away here or there. Uh, I'm of the belief that if you want to be a well-rounded magician, you need to know the history of the art. And I'm not really alone in that belief. I know my late friend Denny Haney was a big believer in knowing the history and reading the biographies of the many magicians. Uh, I was already a book guy before I met Denny. Uh, But thanks to him and others, my library now today is well over a thousand books on magic. And if you wonder where I find my information for the podcast, well, source number one is always my library. Source two, askalexander.com and usually some other online magazine libraries. And another source, uh, I use our newspaper archives online. The final source is usually uh, stories from living magicians about the various individuals that I cover. Uh, And if you're wondering my qualifications, well, I have written the magicdetective.com blog for nine years and 775 articles on magic history. Uh, I've also lectured on magic and magic history at conventions and for historical societies. Finally, you might wonder, why? Why would anybody care about magic history? And really, um, the simplest answer I can give you is it's our heritage. Um, It can only benefit you, really, in the long run. It can inspire you to find unique presentational ideas for routines. It could reveal to you a fantastic uh, piece of magic that's long been forgotten. And it could inspire you to take an older piece of magic and update it. For the 21st century. Knowing your magic history can only really benefit you, and those things I listed are some pretty practical reasons for sure. The podcast can be found on multiple platforms, including iTunes, Stitcher, and Spotify, usually under the podcast sections. Uh, it's great to listen to on your, uh, on, your, uh, on your phone or mobile device. And, um, uh, and by the way, if you do listen to it on iTunes and you love the podcast, please consider giving the podcast five stars and leaving a review. The, the good reviews uh, and the, the good ratings, they help people to find the podcast easier. So um, I want to get a bigger audience, and that's one way to do it. Uh, by the way, you can also find the podcast on your computer by going to magicdetectivepodcast.com. So that's going to be it right now for the uh, newsy type of stuff. Let's get right into today's podcast. This is actually part two of a Doug Henning podcast. Uh, by the way, today, May 3rd, is Doug Henning's birthday. So happy birthday, Mr. Henning. Um, on episode 13, I did a tribute to Doug Henning uh, episode and in that, I, uh, I gave some biographical information, but I got on this long tangent about his various TV specials, and I ran out of time uh, as I was talking about them. I think I got to episode, or, or not episode, but uh, special number four, and I looked at the clock, and I was at an hour, and I said, okay, that's it. I got to wrap this up at an hour. So my intention was to do a part two, and this is part two of that tribute to Doug Henning, and basically here I'll be talking more about the specials. So let's get right into uh, The World of Magic number five. This one appeared in 1979 on NBC television. The uh, co-host of this special was Bill Cosby, and he also featured guests Barbie Benton and Melba Moore. Uh, This was a unique special because this was the first one that was filmed before a live audience but was not uh, presented live on TV. The previous four specials had been done live. 
Uh, this one was recorded in front of a live audience. It was done at the Las Vegas Hilton Hotel. And there's some really interesting things about this particular special. It opens with Jim Steinmeier's Elevator Illusion. And this is the very first time that anybody got to see the Elevator Illusion. It was called the Celestial Elevator. And Doug's was different than all the ones that have come since. His was on, a, I guess, a raised platform. It looked like it maybe was 10 to 12 inches uh, off the ground. You could see underneath it. The front door was open. The back actually laid down. So you could see completely through the uh, the elevator. It had a sort of a, a brick motif on the outside and the inside of the elevator. And of course, the whole thing was closed up. And just like the, the versions today, you saw the silhouette of Doug coming down on the front. Uh, looked like he was, you know, coming, arriving in the elevator. And then the front door would open. Now, that wasn't the end. Of course, the appearance was great. But what a lot of people missed was the entire inside of the elevator had changed uh, before it had this brick motif on the inside. And after he made his appearance, it had his, uh, I guess you would call it his signature cloud, blue uh, cloud um, motif. And it was the first version of the uh, elevator illusion. It's one I really liked. Uh, I think it's my favorite version. Uh, next comes the uh, a, a fire sequence where he does a dancing cane that's on fire. He does the fire dome illusion. Um, there's a beautiful flaming backdrop or, you know, images of flames on a backdrop. It's just beautiful. And then he goes into things that go bump in the night with the tiger finale. This is the second time Doug used things that go bump in the night. And it wouldn't be the last time that he used that great illusion on one of his specials. And you, this is also uh, special five is the first time the uh, cloud in the rainbow um, imagery shows up. It's everywhere. It's in the backdrops. It's on the props. It's uh, really customizes his props. And, and really, um, I think before there was a tendency to go towards like children's blocks and that sort of look. But this um, this cloud motif and and rainbows was more Doug Henning, and I just I I thought it looked great myself. I believe they go to a commercial then, and then when they come back, you see Bill Cosby for the first time, and and Cosby and I, I just let me say something really quick. Now I know Cosby today has uh, brings up a lot of negativity, and uh, I'm just going to ask for the benefit of the, the of Doug Henning that you just forget about all of today's Bill Cosby and just remember that in the time that this was filmed in 1979, Bill Cosby was one of the biggest stars on television. And this was also the second time that Cosby worked with Doug Henning. And he was he was actually much better this time, I thought, than he was on the, the first special. And he basically comes out from time to time um, talking about the finale. Uh, Cosby has this idea that he's going to build this uh, incredible illusion that Doug has to escape from. And, and he's just teasing it throughout the, uh, throughout the special. So that's what Cosby does on this first uh, time out. And then uh, Doug goes into some close-up magic, and he does uh, a wonderful floating cork. I think it was Fred Capp's floating cork and just a beautiful uh, rendition of a floating wine cork. He does a, a barehanded goldfish production, uh, puts the goldfish into a little glass of water. And then a really great mystery that uh, was my first exposure to Paul Harris. It was a trick that was called Twilight and uh, I bought it way back in the day. Uh, here's the effect. You had a, a little pocket mirror and a close-up pad and a coin. And you would place the coin on the table and then you'd take that little pocket mirror, re little rectangular pocket mirror, and you'd set it halfway over uh, the coin on its edge. So what you got in the reflection was, it looked like a whole coin in the reflection. And then as you moved the mirror back, it looked like a second coin was, in, you know, in the mirror. Of course, this is just a, a, the uh, the wonderful optical illusion that happens with mirrors, of course. But then Doug would take and he reached up with uh, his index finger and his thumb, his thumb going behind the mirror, index finger on the coin, and he slid 
the coin to the side, and as he slid it to the side, it actually looks like he's pulling the second coin out of the mirror. And sure enough, there are two coins. And he does this over and over until he eventually ends up with four uh, coins. These are half dollars. It is a beautiful illusion, and it's called Twilight by Paul Harris. Then uh, we go into more, I, I guess you'd call it signature Henning uh, sleight of hand. He does a matrix with some seashells. And he finishes with a, a routine that I call the comeback coins. It's where um, I found it in the uh, Bill Tars. Now you see it, now you don't. And it's done with coins in there. But Henning does it with seashells. And at the end, he magically produces a little uh, a little turtle that he puts in the glass with the goldfish. So it's a really great segment of close-up magic. Next, they go into uh, uh, a Western motif, and he's, his dancers are all dressed in sort of cowboyish kind of gear, and they do uh, the illusion that's known as barricaded barrels. It's also known as through the eye of a needle, uh, usually it's done by putting an assistant in a barrel, uh, basically trapped in a barrel uh, by uh, there's like large spikes that go through that. Uh, they don't go through the assistant. They just kind of create like a jail cell inside this barrel that's sitting horizontally on a stand. And the other barrel is uh, empty and they bring the two of them together and somehow the assistant passes from one barrel through the uh, bars and actually through a cover that's on the barrels as well into the other barrel. In this instance, Doug was the one that did the illusion. So that was a, a neat little twist. Usually the usually the magician's too big to fit inside these things, but in this case, uh, Doug fit in perfect and uh, did a great job with uh, with that particular mystery. Uh, after the next commercial, Cosby comes out again, and once again he's talking about the finale of the special and Doug goes into kind of a standard uh, effect, which is uh, they call it money to burn, which I think you obviously you're going to know what that is. It's uh, to borrow a dollar bill from somebody in the audience and that dollar bill eventually ends up inside a lemon. So not nothing really revolutionary there and it was good, but um, I'm not sure that it was uh, what's the word? Uh, henninged up enough. <laughs> That's the right word. Uh, then they do this unusual shadow sequence where they cast a shadow of a couple dancers on a, uh, a cloth and those shadows change to Doug. Then there's this crazy unusual cabinet made out of a translucent fabric. It's a really big cabinet, and you kind of see through it, kind of not. Doug walks, steps inside this cabinet, and he holds up a piece of paper in the center of it, and he does hand shadows. And every hand shadow he does turns into the real thing. For example, he does a hand shadow of a rabbit, and then he breaks the paper and reaches through, and a rabbit appears. Uh, then he does a parrot, and a parrot appears. And finally, he eventually puts up a large piece of paper, and it makes a girl appear. In this case, it's uh, Barbie Benton, who was a popular um, actress and model from the 1970s. After this, they do the Book of Life. Now, this is not Hardeen's Book of Life. This is David Bamberg's Book of Life. So it's a little bit different. And they're a, they basically, you see this... Uh, a book-like looking thing, and they open up and they show the different pages, and these are all done in this uh, very rainbow uh, celestial looking thing. And they open it up, they show the different pages, and then finally, on the last page, they produce Melba Moore out of the cabinet. And then Doug Henning and Bill Cosby go into Channing Pollock's Double Sawing in Half, and they use uh, Barbie Benton and Melba Moore as the two people that they, uh, they're they going to saw in half. Now, this was a great, great routine. And Doug actually did the double sawing in half numerous times. He did it on The Tonight Show with Johnny Carson. He did it on a, um, 
I want to say some sort of award show, and I think he used Floris Henderson. I think he did it along with her. I'm just going off a of memory on that one. But it was a great routine for Doug. And, um, and I believe they eventually put the double sawing in Merlin as well. Great stuff. And, of course, it has a bit of a surprise ending at the end. And then we go to commercial, and we come back. One of my all-time favorite Doug Henning illusions, not created by him, but featured by him, and that is the flexible mirror. And the flexible mirror that Doug used was uh, made by Bill Schmelk. It is... I just love that trick. I loved it the first time I saw it. And <clears throat> I have, what do I have, three of them? <laughs> it's a great, it basically you take a needle and push it through a mirror numerous times and then you bend the mirror. And it's just, it's great. Love it. Uh, that leads to walking through a plate glass mirror. This again, another Steinmeier illusion. So this is the first time that walking through a plate glass mirror is seen, and that is classic Doug Henning. The illusion after that, it's one that they were using to promote the special, and that was they were going to change Doug into a live shark. It sounds good. Sounds interesting. I'm not sure it's quite as uh, strong as uh, it sounds, um, I watched it again recently, and, and actually it wasn't as bad as I remember. It's a real shark in there for sure, and it was dangerous for Doug to do, but I'm not sure if it just had the impact. I think, you know, people think shark, they think Jaws, and I also believe that's why this was in there, because the Jaws movies had been out, and that was, you know, in the public's consciousness, so... Was the illusion that great? Probably not. And I think, and I could be wrong about this, somebody correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe that the tank that they used uh, to uh, for, for Doug to change into the, uh, the shark, I believe that was later used by Steve Baker uh, when he did, uh, he, he did an unusual underwater escape inside the tank, but not a water torture cell. He was actually chained to the bottom of a, of a large tank. And I believe this was the same tank. I believe. I could be wrong about that. Uh, okay, so let's go back to the special. The finale was the Rube Goldberg escape uh, presented by Cosby. Uh, from what I understand, this was a Doug Henning's idea, this whole Rube Goldberg thing. And it's really, uh, as far as... Um, illusions really unique i mean you've got one thing that pushes another thing that pushes another thing that causes this to do i mean it's crazy and doug is um doug is put inside he's tied to a pole and covered with uh some makeshift box or something and eventually a boulder is supposed to fall down on him and he's got to escape before this happens and it's yeah it's corny and it's goofy and it's clearly the audience is in on the whole corny and goofy thing. It's, you know, there's no way to get around it with the, the way the contraption looks. But it's really mystifying at the same time because when that boulder falls down and Doug is gone, that's surprise number one. But then the way the boulder falls over the edge, it's pushed by this giant mouse. And Doug Henning actually climbs out of the giant mouse that is above from where he was before. So. It's really, uh, it's really good. And from what I understand, years later, Lance Burton got permission to do the Rube Goldberg thing. I think his setup was different, uh, but um, he got permission to do it. I never got to see uh, Lance's version of the Rube Goldberg effect. But that's, uh, that was special number five. It, I, I really believe special number five is probably the best special out of all the World of Magic's um, the scripting was better, dialogue, all of it was uh, it was much, much, much better. So that's special number five. Let's get to special number six. Uh, oh, let me before I do special number six, I do want to mention this. As far as these specials, if you watch them now, and you can go on YouTube and see them, um, if you didn't grow up in that time, if you never got to see Doug Henning live, there's every chance that you're watching these going, this is awful. This is, bleh. this is, how could anybody 
like this. It's uh, how does Henning have such a high standing when this is what he does? It's you have to remember it's um, you have to remember the time period, of course. And one thing I will say about the TV specials, as much as I loved all the TV specials, they they did not capture Doug exactly right. And here, the best way to describe it, and I'm not sure if I mentioned this on a previous podcast or not, but you can go see David Copperfield and you go, wow, he is amazing. And you see Penn and Teller and you go, wow, they do, they do great magic. And you see Chris Angel and you go, wow, that's, you know, he's a great magician. But when you saw Doug Henning, you didn't really say he was a great magician as much as you went away saying he was magic. And there's a difference there. And I remember being at the Warner Theater in, in Washington uh, one year when Doug came to town. And I remember the, the audience of lay people just enthralled with him like, like no other performer I had seen, a magical performer. Doug came out with a microphone and he started to address the audience and the mic was breaking up and he eventually the mic went out and he, and he looked at it and he took the mic and made the mic disappear and the audience just loved it. And they, of course, they all realized he was on a cordless mic. So it was all, you know, <laughs> it was all part of the show. But it was still, uh, it was just fantastic. And, and they loved it and they were in on it. And they just, you know, I just don't see that with other performers. Uh, his likability factor was through the roof. And, and he didn't, he wasn't the brooding magician that so many magicians before and after were and are. Uh, he was enthusiastic about magic and he loved magic and it showed in everything he did. So you have to keep that in mind when you're watching these specials. And there, there are still great moments of magic within all the specials. There's plenty of corny stuff too, but there's, there are great moments of magic. Like, uh, like I said, when, uh, the celestial elevator and walking through a mirror and the, the water levitation from uh, a previous special. I mean, that's all great magic. So, Okay, so now we are on special number six. This one appeared in 1980. It was filmed in Utah at the Osmond Studios. Uh, the guests on the special were Marie Osmond, Ricky Schroeder, and Shields and Yarnell. Shields, Shields and Yarnell were a uh, mime duo that were very popular during the time. The special opens with um, a Jarrett-based production of Ricky Schroeder, Marie Osmond, and Doug Henning. And the production of Doug involved an overhead shot, a really unusual stretched uh, uh, painting of Doug that was reflected on a uh, large chrome tube and the reflection, uh, when you saw it from above, it looked like a normal-sized Doug. But um, I'm not sure it played really well. And I think it was uh, the you know, interesting concept, but I don't know if it worked for the live audience or for the home audience. But it was a great, a great intro, you know, as far as it, it, um, making three people appear. And then Doug began speaking, and he goes right into a torn and restored tissue paper type of effect where he makes a baby chick appear. Next, there's a series of illusions that are, each one is used to produce an, an animal. First one looks like a, uh, like a toy block, and it's an idea of Okitos, and it's used to produce a little, uh, little puppy dog. Uh, next, they go to a lion's cage, and they produce a small tiger. And finally, they have this enormous box that they move forward and are able to show completely empty. And then they produce a baby elephant out of it, which is a pretty amazing illusion, I thought. Uh, then they go to commercial. When they come back from commercial, they're using a sphinx table where Doug mysteriously changes into shields in Yarnell. And by the way, this table is surrounded by a ring of spectators, so it adds another... Uh, mysterious element to it. And Doug uh, reappears from a box that's lowered uh, from above. So that's uh, a really cool effect. Now Doug goes into his uh, close-up segment and there's some great stuff here. 
Uh, first is the Thurston Rising cards. Now, I got to see this live several times, and wow, this, it looked good on TV, looked even better live and in person. Uh, three cards are named, and those three cards are, are put back in a deck, and they rise uh, in slightly, each one is slightly different way, but just beautiful, uh, beautiful mystery. Uh, next, he does a, uh, a card and coin routine. He does a, uh, if I remember correctly, um, produces a coin from a flash of fire. And then he takes a deck of cards and two cards are removed and coins appear from uh, within the cards. So it's another great uh, mystery leading up to the miser's dream, which he begins by performing on stage and pulling coins out of the ears of the spectators on stage and then actually goes into the audience and does your classic miser's dream type effect. They go to another commercial and when they come back, it's maybe my favorite Doug Henning illusion of all time, which was the giant Gazinta boxes. You're probably familiar with this, the, the, the small version that is made of little plastic boxes fit in the palm of your hand. One box fits inside the other. Uh, it was also the Drybeck die is another version of this. But Doug here, he's doing it with large boxes. Uh, one box has his rainbow uh, colored design on it, and the other one looks like a crate. And he takes the uh, the one box, the rainbow colored box, out of the crate and then places the crate inside the rainbow colored box. So there's that bit of mystery to it. But then at the end, actually produces Marie Osmond from the whole thing. So you get uh, you get the Gazinta box effect and then you get the production of a person. And for what, from what I understand, uh, when they did this on tour, they eventually produced two people out of those Gazinta boxes, which I can't even imagine, quite frankly. Doug goes into a floating candle routine with Marie Osmond. This was the same floating candle routine that he did with uh, Crystal Gale on one of her specials, and it's a floating candle, and they have a song that they sing, We Must Believe in Magic is the name of the song. And uh, so it's a cute segment. And then they go into a really quick illusion where Marie vanishes into a box. And then um, I believe she changed places with Doug and Doug ends up in the audience. So next we have the puppet sequence with Shields and Yarnell. And there's some cool stuff here. First, you get to see an early version of Jim Steinmeier's illusion that would later be known as modern art. Um, it's not quite there yet. But you, if, you, if you see the special and you see the prop, you'll recognize it because it looks very similar. It was an early rendition of the modern art illusion. You also get to see something that uh, hadn't been done for, I don't know, when the special came out, probably 80 years. And that was the Astarte Levitation, which, is performed, uh, which was performed by Keller and Herman. And Doug Henning performs it with uh with uh, uh yarnell and it's it's a it's a very interesting illusion i mean she floats up she spins she does somersaults and it's uh if you think about when it came out the turn of the, the century it's quite remarkable but i have to admit i have seen another version of the astarte illusion that was done at the uh, la conference on magic history and that one, I thought, was much better. The levitation and, and actually the acrobatics that she does were um, better. Uh, now, I'm going to just go out on a limb and say both of these were probably done by Johnny Gone. And it could be that um, whatever the technology was had improved. Or maybe they just uh, you know, had more rehearsals for the thing or you know, figured out more choreography or whatever for the Astarte Illusion. The latter version is better. Still, Doug's is unique for the time, I thought. I thought it was really cool. Uh, he does another illusion in there where he falls to pieces. This is Doug Henning, falls to pieces. The pieces of Doug Henning are reassembled uh, in a, or, or thrown in a box, vanish, and he ends up reassembled elsewhere. Now we go to another commercial, and we come back another of my favorite Doug Henning pieces, and it's a sack escape. 
And I have to tell you that when I first saw this, I, I had no idea. I, I just assumed it was a gimmick sack. And I, I'd watch it over and over because I recorded it. And I'd watch it over and over. And What is he doing? How I don't get this. How does... This is either... This is either a stooge or this is one of the greatest pieces of magic ever. And I would look in books for it and I could never find it. And one day I was up at Denny's Magic Shop, Denny and Lee's Magic Studio in Baltimore. And I mentioned it to Denny and I said, hey, this this sack escape that Doug Henning did. And didn't miss a beat. Denny goes, oh yeah, that's Fu Manchu's sack escape. That's in uh, Tarbell number five. And I said to Denny, no, it isn't. And he said, oh, yeah, it is. And I'm like, I know that sack escape in Tarbell number five. That's not it. And he said, that's it. And I went back and I looked it up and I'm like, I was looking at this very thing. And, it, and I didn't recognize that this was what Doug Henning did. And it's a great sack escape. It's um, very deceptive, but it's a little difficult to do. But... Um, Doug does a great job with it, and I absolutely love that particular uh, escape. Next comes the Indian rope trick, and I have to say that um, the Indian rope trick has this uh, reputation for being this wonderful, mystical illusion, and it seems like everybody that does the a version of the Indian rope uh, um, illusion, well, it's just not very good. And uh, I would say that uh, Doug's version of the Indian rope trick is is up there with all the others. It's it's okay. It's not great. It's just okay. So uh, now we get to another vignette. This is another vignette with Shields and Yarnell and Doug. And Doug is um, there's like a sign that says you know go see Doug Henning at uh, you know at such and such, and he's actually part of the sign. Doug is and. Uh, Shids and Yarnell are uh, young kids. Or this is the character they play. And it's basically a vignette for a floating balloon illusion. And it's cute, but uh, it, it uses more mime. I think it's, it was there to feature Shields and Yarnell's skills more than the magic. So the final illusion is really unusual. It's a, uh, it features a gazebo that is opened up on all the sides and they use it to produce a marching band. And then at the end of the marching band, um, appearing, Doug goes into the gazebo, disappears and turns into the band leader. And I don't know. Um, it's good. It's really good. Look good on TV. Uh, I don't know if it has the emotional connection with the marching band. I'm not sure uh, in, in that regard, but it was good. It was good stuff. And I did later find out that, uh, due to production delays on the special, uh, the latter half of the special was shot with no audience. So imagine that. So, uh, you know, if you watch the special halfway through, you figure there's nobody there and that's how they had to shoot it. Just remarkable. Now we get into 1981, another World's Greatest Magic special. And this one featured Angelian, Cheris Alexander, the L.A. Rams cheerleaders, Billy Crystal, a voiceover by Orson Welles, and some guy named Bruce Jenner. And there's some, uh, there's some good magic here. Um, this was also... I think this was taped before a live audience, I think, although I have to admit that certain segments of the special really sound like canned uh, audience laughter and canned audience applause to me, but that maybe that's just me. Uh, Doug opens the special by appearing behind a door frame and then one at a time produces the, all the guests from this same door frame. They go into his dream house, this is what they call it, and he does a production of A Glass of Milk. He does a, uh, an illusion called Multibin Parvo, which is a bunch of glasses. And you have uh, milk in the smallest glass. Or Actually, I think in this was the special they used lemonade. So he had a little tiny glass of lemonade. And that little tiny glass of lemonade is poured into the next cup, which is larger. And it fills that cup. Then they pick up that cup and pour it into the next cup, which is larger, and it fills that one. 
And then finally, they take that one and pour it into the empty pitcher, and it fills the pitcher. And then from the pitcher, they go back and they fill up all the cups. So it's called Multum in Parvo, and it's good. I, I liked it. I have one. It's, uh, it's a great trick. Then he does the Slidini Silk and Apple, which is classic. He does an unusual effect where he produces objects from a mirror, which is kind of hard to describe. You just have to see it to believe it. This is... <laughs> How do I put this? How do I do this without... Uh, giving anything away. This is a precursor of a much later illusion that would be done on the internet. Let's just put it that way. Okay, that, that leaves it wide open. Um, then they go into the room of the future, and this is... Uh, oh, I'm sorry, uh, is that the room of the futures? No, I'm sorry, room of the future is not next. They, they start to, but then they stop. They go into the room of the past, and this is, of all of these in this special, is probably my favorite. They open with the Jarrett box, and this is a, a creation of Guy Jarrett that was done in the Thurston show, and I love this uh, this thing. They use they it's just large rectangular box that's probably two feet off the ground, and they uh, they step inside of it. They come out. Uh, Bruce Jenner says, "Well, there's nobody in there," and then they produce two or three cheerleaders and then two or three more cheerleaders, and two or three more. And eventually they produce 21 people out of this cabinet. And I don't know, It's to me, I loved it. I thought it was great. I've heard other people say, you know, I don't get it, what's the magic? So, you know, I guess it's open to interpretation. Next they go into just a bunch of antique magic. Um, the flying cages and canary, that's great. A vanishing water bowl uh, illusion, which is really cool. Uh, uh, some rope magic. They do cut and restore rope, and they do it in several different ways. Uh, where did the ducks go? That's just classic, and you know, looks great when Doug does it. So we go to the room of the future, and this is where you have more close-up card magic. So he does uh, card warp, and I'm not sure if this was the first time that. Card Warp was done on TV or not. I know it was, Card Warp was getting popular. Then he does a really uh, cool linking playing cards. He tears the center out of the playing cards and links them. It's very cool. He does a matrix with torn pieces of cards, which I, I'm not sure. I, I want to say that was Goshman's, but I'm not 100% on that one. Um, Al Goshman's, I could be wrong. Oh, then they stand up and they do a, a dancing ring. It's like a hula hoop size ring that seems to have a mind of its own. And then a girl is produced from it. That's another one you just have to see to understand. And then they do a, a really strange sawing with a giant disc. So it's not, they don't use a saw. They use this giant disc that passes through a person, and I later found out that this particular illusion was the inspiration for Jonathan Pendragon's Clearly Impossible, uh, the method. Let's just put it that way. I'll just leave it there. Next, they go into a routine with Billy Crystal, and this prop that they use, I, I don't know if this was, um, I don't know the history of this particular thing, but it looked really cool, and I've seen Michael Cabanaro do a version of this trick on his TV special, which uh, also very, very cool. Uh, they use this, I think they used it to produce Billy Crystal, and then Billy Crystal goes into doing his impression of Muhammad Ali and Howard Cosell, so it's good stuff. That's, uh, the, that's the good part of the special. And then we get to the last part of the special, which... Uh, how do I put it? It's a train wreck. It is a train wreck. I don't. I don't even know if it was a good idea or not. Um, I understand that it was based on an idea by Andre Cole, but w what showed up on TV uh, is whew, awful. Uh, apparently, the thing cost eighty thousand dollars. It was. Uh, Oh, my gosh. It, it had a narration by uh, Orson Welles. Doug sits on a black horse. 
his wife Debbie sits on a white horse. The they're both in in separate boxes and they come close together, and the boxes join. And then when the boxes separate, uh, Doug and Debbie are sitting on top of a zebra, if I remember correctly. It's so bad. It's so awful. Um, it's just, I, it, you know, probably, hey, this is a good idea on paper. But then the application just didn't work. And it, it, it suffered really, it suffered from editing, I thought. The editing of it just, uh, I mean... I'm just going to leave it there. It was awful. And now we are at the final Doug Henning World of Magic special. This was the Magic on Broadway special shot in New York City in 1982. Eric Estrada makes a, uh, a brief appearance in his Chips uniform. And Doug opens with the vanishing motorcycle. They go into the fire routine that had been done I think on two previous specials. This time, as from the Fire Dome, uh, Doug produces uh, actress Anne Ryan King. They produce a Dalmatian sequence that apparently takes place in Central Park, um, of course on stage, but you know Central Park themed. And Doug does the first Rubik's Cube illusion on TV. Who knew he was such a trendsetter? Uh, I remember seeing this going, wow, that is really cool. And eventually, uh, I think Daryl put it out. And for the longest time, I just I loved doing it because nobody else was doing Rubik's Cubes. And then, what is it, 10, 15 years ago, the Rubik's Cube thing uh, came back out of nowhere. And now it's uh, uh, people hate the Rubik's Cube. I mean, <laughs> there's just so many Rubik's Cube tricks. And um, it's getting tiresome. But um, he does Chop Cup in this uh, segment as well. And then he does Andre Cole's No Feet Illusion, which I've always really liked. And then something really clever. He, he brings out Andrea McCardle, who was the original Annie on Broadway, and she sings a couple lines from, uh, from Annie. The sun will come out tomorrow. And there's a what looks like a slide behind them. And it's actually, the slide is a giant genie tube. So she gets up on this slide. She sings a couple more notes of, uh, uh, from Annie. And then she jumps into this tube. And when she comes out the other end, she's now Allison Smith, who was the 1982 Annie on Broadway. And she, uh, and she sings a couple notes from, uh, from Annie. So that was really a nice nod to Broadway and a really cool... Uh, illusion using a giant genie tube. Next, we have uh, Doug Henning's Elevator, this time producing Tony Randall rather than Doug Henning. And they do a black and white mummy wrap, which I think was based on a Dante version of the mummy wrap. Uh, next, there is the uh, Egyptian routine from special number four with the Dakota chair and the Pharaoh chair. That's brought back. Um, they do a floating ball with Anne Rhine King, and I always loved Doug Henning's floating ball uh, presentation. I just thought it was great. And here it is again. And then they do the uh, water levitation again, a classic Doug Henning mystery. Next comes uh, Man Without a Middle, which is uh, usually Woman Without a Middle, but this time it's presented by Debbie Henning, and Doug is the one put in the box, and his middle is made to disappear. Interesting side note here, apparently when they went on tour, they had a different version of this particular effect. That particular version of Man Without a Middle is featured in a book called Square One, that Magic Magazine put out, and it's really different. It That version was created to be able to do in the round, because I guess during his last tour, they did a lot of uh, shows that were in theaters in the round. So this, this version that's in this book, Square One, allowed you to do that. So, But here on the special, it's the classic version. It's just done, done with Doug rather than Debbie. Uh, next comes uh, a sequence with Anita Morris. Anita was in the original magic show on Broadway, so she's back. A nice nod to her. And they do a thing where they uh, have a million dollars and they cause a million dollars to appear and then a million dollars to vanish. So that's pretty clever. Uh, let's see. Sub Trunk with, uh, with Doug Henning, The Metamorphosis. His 
his favorite illusion, as far as I know. They do a, a stretcher illusion, which is okay. And then the final illusion on the final Doug Henning world of magic, things that go bump in the night again. But it's a great, it's a great illusion, so it's really hard, to, uh, really hard to knock it. So those are the Doug Henning specials. Now, I have to tell you, this is kind of funny. When I was, um, uh, well, that last special came out in 1982, and some, some year, sometime around 1985, I had this memory of another Doug Henning special. And I would ask people about it, and they would just look at me like I had three heads and um, apparently there never was another special, but I don't know where. I must have dreamt one. I must have had a dream one night where I dreamt that there was another Doug Henning special, and he did all this cool stuff, And uh, but it never really happened. Now, what did happen was Doug was doing appearances on TV, and he did a Tonight Show appearance. He did... Uh, an appearance on on the Joan Rivers TV show, and he did an, another um, appearance on um, a talk show hosted by Suzanne Summers. And he was doing the pole levitation, origami, the toy store illusion, and then uh, the ring in bread which were all, those were four unique effects that were done in the final touring show uh, of Doug Henning. And they never made it into a special. Unfortunately, they were great. Um, Origami. I mean, Doug was the first to do origami. And Doug did not use big samurai swords like everybody else did. So uh, I remember watching origami. I remember sitting in like the third row in the audience going, this is impossible. I don't, this is, there's no way this can be done. This is, it just devastated me. It was great. So those kind of effects uh, would have made a great special, really. And it's, you know, pure Jim Steinmeier. Even the, uh, the bread uh, uh, illusion where the, uh, the ring, the borrowed rings appear in bread, um, that's another great one. It was an idea by Orson Welles that uh, they adapted and put it into Doug's show, and I thought it worked out perfect for Doug. Just great stuff. I mean, if you just look at that ladder magic, the Toy Store, uh, is that what it's called, Toy Store? Yeah, the Toy Store illusion, another great mystery. And this was, I'll just describe it very quickly. It was a, um, kind of a dollhouse sort of thing on a very thin platform, and Doug would open the front and the back, nothing in there, close it, and then open it again, it would be filled with flowers, and then he'd wipe all the flowers away and throw one inside and do some magic gesture, and then his wife, Debbie, would come out of this thing, filling up the entire contents of the box. It's a great illusion. Uh, Jonathan Pendragon did a version of this that I want to say he called the, um, the theater something. Oh, I'm sorry, Jonathan, I'm forgetting what you called this. But his looked like a miniature theater, and they would show, he could show it empty, and then he produced, I want to say he produced two big dogs out of it, and then eventually Charlotte. Um, I, liked, I liked both of them. I liked the one that Pendragons did. I liked the one that Doug Henning did. Uh, just all great magic. Of course, the pole levitation, uh, many Performers went on to do the pole levitation. Mark Kalin and Ginger, uh, David Copperfield, just um, great, great illusions created by Jim Steinmeier and first featured by Doug Henning. So that's going to do it for, uh, for my reviews of the Doug Henning World of Magic TV specials. And by the way, you can go on YouTube and watch all of the specials. That's from the very first one with the uh, water torture cell that was actually not called the World of Magic special. Uh, I, they, I think all the consecutive ones were called Doug Henning's World of Magic, but that one wasn't. There's all, all eight of them are online. You can see them all on YouTube. And here is something that I have recently discovered. Earlier in the podcast, you heard me mention that some of the specials really don't hold up to time, unfortunately. I do believe they all have great magic in them, but there are moments where there are things that are kind of corny and campy and, you know, just not 21st century, even though the magic I still think is good. And I said that Doug, his persona, his uh, who he really was, was not 
captured well enough in the specials. So here's what I found. There's a video on YouTube of a live performance of Doug Henning, a live theater performance. It's not part of a special. Somebody must have sat there with a, uh, a camera and recorded it. And I'm not sure how long it is. I want to say maybe 15 minutes, maybe a little bit longer. But what's wonderful about it is you see Doug interacting with the audience. You don't hear the corny jokes because they're gone. Um, what you do hear are just fun stuff. You hear the audience reaction too, which I really like because uh, as I mentioned earlier, audiences were into Doug Henning. They just, they thought they just adored him because uh, frankly, he was super likable. So you see that in this video, you see how likable he is. You see how the audience is totally into what he's doing when he does tell a joke it's funny they respond appropriately they, there's no groans some of the effects that he does on this video needle through balloon uh, it's classic okay it's been done and done and done but back in his time uh, it was pretty new and he does a great job with it he does a, a split deck routine which is really great he does uh, the my, one of my favorite tricks, a flexible mirror, needle through the mirror. And again, it's a, a, great, uh, a great piece. And then walking through a mirror. And I can't remember if he did anything else on that, on that uh, YouTube video. But, but again, you get to see it all in front of a live audience and how a live audience responds and how... Oh, he also does the sack escape. My, you know, again, one of my favorites, the Fu Manchu sack escape. And that one, it, what's interesting about that, if you go back and you watch special... What was that special number six? I think it was number six. Um, the one that was filmed in Osmond Studios, that's the one where the uh, sack escape appears. If you go back and watch it, the whole routine is filled with a lot of really corny jokes. And in his presentation here in front of the live audience, there there's like one of those, but that's it. It's not loaded down with, you know, campiness and corniness. So it's so well done and just, I love it. So I encourage you to check that out. How do you do that? Well, here's what you do. You go over to my blog, which is themagicdetective.com. I've already posted a piece because I saw this video and I was like, everybody's got to see this video. So the video is on that page on themagicdetective.com on the, the piece on Doug Henning. I've uh, embedded the video there, or you can go over to, you know, click it and go over to YouTube and watch it, either one. But I encourage you to do that. Check out that video because it's, again, it's Doug Henning without the constraints of, a, you know, TV show, TV special, and him performing just as he did thousands of times before a live audience. You are going to love it. It's fantastic. Uh, let me see what else. So uh, once again, it was his birthday today. Happy 72nd birthday. It's unfortunate that he passed away. Of course, it's, you know, we're losing so many people in the world of magic and every one of them just leaves a, a big empty hole in, uh, in, in magic. But uh, with Doug, if he had been alive, I, I always imagine he'd, he'd look like, uh, he'd kind of look like Merlin the Magician today. And still doing great magic, and uh, I wish he had, uh, wish he was still around. He was one of a kind, very unique, very special. I also want to encourage you, if you want to learn more about the life of Doug Henning, to go over to DougHenningProject.com. That's Neil McNally's website, blog, for all things Doug Henning related. He's also working on a Doug Henning documentary that... Uh, I'm on pins and needles about. I can't wait to see it. I'm not sure when it comes out. That's something to look forward to. Please check out DougHenningProject.com. I hope you've enjoyed this episode. Coming up in future podcasts, you may have noticed, um, <laughs> if you've listened to the previous uh, 19 podcasts, uh, I did quite a few on Houdini early on. I always had a, a segment on Houdini. I have... Uh, drifted away from that slightly, not because my interest in Houdini is any less. It's just um, we have certain individuals in the magic world, uh, in particular uh, my buddy John Cox, who just does a an incredible job 
with his blog, which is wildabouthoudini.com. And I encourage you to check it out. I'm sure you already have, but if you've never checked it out, check it out. It's fantastic. It's hard to keep up with the guy. I don't know. He's He has a regular job. I don't know how in the world he uh, he puts so much Houdini stuff up and does a regular job. Uh, he's fantastic. But uh, because he's had so much stuff up there and it's just rich content, uh, I decided at least for a few episodes to focus on other magicians rather than Houdini, but, but, but that's not going to last forever. So there are some Houdini episodes coming up. Some of them are Houdini tied with other individuals, no pun intended there. So uh, that's something to look forward to for my uh, Houdini friends. I think you'll really enjoy that. And uh, there, of course, there are more episodes coming up with uh, female magicians. So I'm personally looking forward to that because, uh, I that hasn't been covered enough, really. Uh, there haven't been a lot of female magicians, but there have been more than you realize. So I do want to give them their their just uh, just due. And uh, I guess that's going to wrap it up for this episode of the Magic Detective Podcast. And, and once again, if you like the uh, like the podcast, if you're on a platform where there's a little heart at the bottom, you can click that and like the podcast. If not, if you're if you're listening on iTunes, for example. The best thing to do, if you love the podcast, give me five stars and, and leave a review if you could, because the reviews that you leave help the uh, the podcast. It helps the show in the ratings and it makes it easier for people to find the podcasts. Right now, I think I have one written review and five or six stars from people. So that's awesome. And I've been getting a lot of email from folks saying how much they love the podcast. And I really greatly appreciate that. Everybody that's uh, contacted me, I'm just, I'm so glad that there's an audience out there for this. And, oh, and the other thing you can do is tell other people about the podcast. Um, just don't keep it to yourself. Tell others, go, you know, tell them, Hey, go to magicdetectivepodcast.com. You can listen to it online or you can find it on like I said, iTunes or Stitcher or Spotify, or there's, I think I'm on five or six different platforms. So, so that's going to do it for me. Uh, my name is Dean Carnegie. I am the magic detective. Thank you for listening to the, uh, the podcast and we will see you next time.